good? You started it? Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's on this Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the men out there. Is there any moments of joys or concerns? Okay. Uh, thank everyone for uh, whoever came and uh, played around last week with the car making. Everybody had a great time. Uh, don't forget, when you're out, you can still buy some things for our little pantry. Uh, we're still doing that all summer long. Uh, so you can feel free to uh, bring some things in for that. And at the end of the service, all men may help themselves to a little treat on the, in the basket by the door for Father's Day. Let us begin our worship.
holy wisdom, we hear your calling us to gather and to hope in your name. Ignite sacred courage in us to proclaim the good news of justice from the comfort and the sanctuary to the public witness of the city gates. Inspire a compelling vision of a gracious, beloved, and empowered community that propels us to confront inequities, challenge privilege, and participate in your creative work in our time. Renew our hope for humanity so that we might rejoice in this inhabited world and delight in our siblings. Amen. Holy and gracious God, fear seeks to be our constant companion. It stifles us with its overwhelming presence and prolific imagination. Fear surrounds us and blocks our vision and your path. Fear keeps us from picking up our cross as much as it suppresses our joy in you. Fear invites us to believe the easy lie rather than confronting the hard truths necessary for your kingdom to come. Too often we cast off your perfect love in favor of insidious fear. Forgive us for choosing fear when we could have you, your presence, and your way as our companion on our journey. Empower us to reject fear and all that fall complicit in dampening your truth. Amen. Amen. Romans 5 reminds us that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. That grace promises the glory of transformation through the acknowledgement of need for it. New life awaits as hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Receive grace, embrace transformation, and enter the newness of life in which Christ fashions our struggles into character and hope. Let us praise God. Get up and eat. 
He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I am alone and left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was spinning mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. <clears throat> Our second lesson is from Colossians 3, starting with the 23rd verse. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our dis disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And the Gospel lesson is from Luke 8, starting with the 26th verse. Then they arrived at the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it has seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off 
and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Grassinus asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Evanston, Illinois. I was working as a campus ministry with uh, University Christian Ministries at Northwestern University. I lived with a group of students in a ministry house called Fisher Folk. I was also part of a group called the Covenant Community. Our, our covenant was a shared commitment to doing inclusive worship and to make justice happen together in the Chicago area. One morning, Howard showed up at Fisher Folk and knocked on the door. Howard was in our orbit of concern. I say orbit because Howard was homeless, and he spent a large part of his time traveling by bus between Evanston and Ann Arbor, Michigan. I guess that traveling gave him a, a rhythm and a pattern to his life. And in each of those places, he had ministries and agencies that provided him sustenance and made sure he had his medications and gave him good care. Hey, Howard, good to see you. How, how, how are you doing? I said, Howard shook his head and he pointed to a, a writing tablet he carried. I read it and it said, I'm not able to talk right now. Oh, I said, are you sick? He, he shook his head and he wrote, if I talk, the demons might find me. Well, I brought him in and it went like that back and forth. Me asking him, him writing on his pad. And finally, I learned that he needed to eat and to get bus fare back to Ann Arbor. So we fed Howard and sent him on his way, expecting to see him back in a few days. There was also Tom, who one day came by and invited me to go for a walk with him around the campus. We came to this particular busy intersection. It was a place where the students coming out of the parking lot would go into a pretty 
frantic flow of traffic on Lakeshore Boulevard, Tom stood there and he announced, now this is the devil's corner. And he wouldn't cross until I prayed with him and asked Jesus to come and help us cross safely. So I did. And now when the traffic slowed, we went across with Tom holding my hand. So back at Fisher Folk, I wondered what I had witnessed. The words devils and demons had dropped out of my vocabulary. They'd been replaced by words like paranoid, schizophrenia, things like that. But here they were, resurfacing again as realities for guys like Howard and Tom, and I expect so many others. I'd like to think that Tom and Howard were in our orbit of concern because somehow they were experiencing incarnate love in that community. Or perhaps it was God's incarnate love shining through us, even through their traumatized psyches. I'd also like to think that I remembered these stories of Howard and Tom because of this story. Luke's version of a story that appears in the big three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where incarnate love in the person of Jesus meets trauma incarnate. A story where incarnations of love and trauma collide is going to be complex. And I have looked at this story through my life again and again, and I've listened to some very fine sermons and lessons about crossing the boundaries of race and prejudice, the boundary between the rich and the poor, like, like Jesus does in this story, to reach people with the gospel. Or how, how the church is called to a ministry of presence with those who are afflicted with moral injury or any form of mental illness or sermons that lament the times when a church like this community in the story will turn its back on Christ's worth there because it's afraid of the consequences. But recently though, I've been seeing how other work this story is doing. Maybe it's because of the war in the Ukraine. Maybe it's because of the epidemic of gun violence that we're seeing on a regular basis these days. Maybe it's because of resurgent white supremacy. I'm beginning to say how this story addresses what life is like in our empire when it convulses. So, the story begins with a man whose misery is so unbearable that he retreats to live among the untroubled dead. His agony is so intense that he smashes himself with rocks, maybe as a distraction from the psychic pain he's enduring. And Luke seems to indicate that a Roman military unit called a legion is stationed nearby, and fresh in the collective memory of those garrisons is a massacre. During the first Jewish war, the Roman general, Lucius Annius, put at least 1,000 rebels to death and destroyed their towns and villages all around in the region of the Gerasenes. And the Gospel writer names this man Legion. That was a clue to the Jewish listeners to this story to associate this man's madness with the presence of that imperial army nearby which was primed for violence at any moment. Maybe this man has been a victim of moral injury. 
a witness to the worst of that violence. Maybe members of his family were among those who were massacred. Or maybe he's become, what we might say, the toxic handler of the effects of Rome's brutal oppression and exploitation of this colony. Whatever the case, the story presents him as out of his mind. Enter the power of God in the person of Jesus. Luke's testimony is that God's power turns things upside down and inside out. Now, it's the demons who are afraid. Afraid enough to give their power to decide their fate over to Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus seems to have compassion even for the demons in that he gives them what they ask for. Rather than go back to the abyss where they came from, seems to be a place too scary even for the demons, they prefer another fate. Going into the bodies of pigs and then plunging down the hillside and drowning in the sea. In that way, according to Jewish mythology, they were returned to a place where the demons could continue to make trouble. Now, this is not a story for the Midwestern pig farmer. It's a story for a Jewish audience who considered pigs to be unclean animals. Now, I could give you a moment to, to think in our context what animals are unclean to you and allow you to substitute those animals for these pigs and you can get some sense of why this is a story of great triumph that Jesus accomplishes over the evil represented by the demons. Demons, pigs, unclean animals, all go. Right? You'd think that everybody would celebrate that, but no. Not everybody is happy about it. Instead of being happy about a man restored to his right mind, they are angry about pigs. A vote is taken, 99 to 1, Jesus must leave. And we're left with a story of a community that's back in bondage to fear. This is what I think the story does. It shows what happens when God's love is allowed to come into any community that is in the grip of fear. Fear is complicated. It doesn't come from just any one place. It comes from many places. And when it comes, it takes prisoners. It causes relationships to break. It clouds the future. It stunts growth. But its power is limited. God's love, represented in this story by Jesus, keeps working and working until someone, anyone, everyone is in their right mind. But lately I've seen how this ancient story might be doing something else. It holds up a mirror to the crack world we live in. I watched a podcast the other day by Russell Moore, who is now working with Christianity Today in a public theology project. and He's been called as an evangelical dissident. And now he was interviewing in this podcast the man who called him that, David Brooks columnist for the New York Times. Here's the first question Moore put to Brooks. Are the times really as crazy as they seem? Or is this just life? Oh, it's beyond dispute, Brooks answered. Then he went on to recite those terrible statistics that we're all too familiar with. The, increase, the increasing rates of depression, the incidences of gun violence, 
suicide, an epidemic of opioids and other substance abuse, despair. Why? Why is this so? Then Brooks began to quote some of the things he'd heard from people. No one knows me well, one person told him. I don't have any close friends, said another. It's a case of moral loneliness, Brooks said. Now, I, I've never heard those two words put together like that. Moral and loneliness? Is that what's driving us crazy? Is that why we have rejected the love of neighbor, God, and country, and have turned to a politics of hate? Because it's easier to say, I'm good, but my opponents are evil, than it is to confess, I'm lonely, I'm hurting, I need the love of God. This, I think, is a story of how the practice of persistent incarnate love for God, neighbor, and country can restore us to our right minds. But it's also a sad story about how a community voted against incarnate love and returned to its bondage to fear. A man restored to his right mind by God's grace and incarnate love, remained in that community to tell the story. What will your story be? Joanne and Dan, 
Katie, Pat, Trisha, Claire, Terry, Nana, Naomi, Debbie, Kay, Tim, Amy, Tim, George and Patty, Tammy, Butch, Josh, Josephine, David, John, Shirley, Judy, Lance, Ben, the family of Barbara Burtz, our church and congregation, for everyone dealing with the coronavirus and for the people of the Ukraine. And let us pray together the prayer our Lord has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And he is not to temptation, but the Lord of us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
May peace be with you as you confront lies with truth and fear with hope. May the abiding one strengthen you to stand in truth and hope. May the living water refresh you with new streams of righteousness. May wisdom be the voice you follow now as you go out into the world, encouraged and emboldened and renewed. Amen. Amen.